Yes. Yeah, so what is up, everyone? This is episode two of the Purpose and Passion podcast. Uh, Corey is with me for episode two. Hello. And uh, I am John Ludwig. So I'm glad a lot of you guys seem to like episode one. I wasn't sure how that was going to be received or how it was going to go overall, especially once I got it into post and edited everything down. It was about an hour and 20 minutes long. I'd like to keep most of the podcast right around that length. Um, yeah, so we are back. We are still here at my house in New Hampshire for now. Episode two, I thought was going to be with Josh Garcia from Revival, but we're going to meet up with him next Saturday. So I'm, I'm really hoping to get this on a weekly regimen so we can get a podcast out once a week would be great, but we're in the middle of the winter in New Hampshire and it's just kind of tough. It's tough to have a bunch of people traveling through your area and yeah, and, and to have a bunch of topics to, to talk on. So next week will be Josh Garcia. The week after that, maybe we'll sit down again. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what else we're going to be doing. We're leading up to Riverside. We're working hard on, on preparation for Riverside and Chattanooga. So I have a few notes in front of me here just to kind of stay on track. This episode is basically, we're just going to tell some stories. <laughs> we're going to talk about our Worthy Z trip in 2018. And a lot of you guys sent a lot of questions in again as well. So we're going to go over all of those. I picked like 20 to 25 maybe. You know, we normally when I when I have like a guest on and I want to be talking to them specifically, we'll have some like specific Q and A's for that guest. And I'll probably tighten down the Q and a time. So we're not spending a ton of time on that, but for episode one and this episode, I'm going to go through most of the Q and A's as before I forget the, we were talking about the Thunderbird Landau, that four door yes. yep. with the suicide rear doors that you found. Uh, that actually, as I'm sure some people were screaming through the speakers that knew about those cars, Apparently, that wasn't a one-year-only car. Right. That is basically a fifth-gen four-door. Yep. So all the four-doors in the fifth-gen Thunderbirds were built from 1967 to 71. They didn't build a ton of them, though. I think they were like 30,000 or something like that from yeah. what I remember reading. But I wanted to I wanted to double-check on that. So, yeah, they, they, they did make the four-door fifth-gen Thunderbirds with the suicide rear doors uh, for uh, 67 to 71. So like a four year, five year, technically production span mm -hmm. and Riverside we're we're getting towards, we're getting towards Riverside. That's March 14th. Again, guys, we're going to, if you guys are down in the Southeast, come out in March for sure. We're going to be there. Uh, Mason and Carly are, are amazing people. This is, Ooh, I should have done my looking on this. I think it's Riverside five. Don't quote me on that. I don't know. I know. I know. You don't know. I'm looking at you as if I'm going to get an answer out of you. Uh, yeah, pretty sure it's Riverside Five. Uh, Mason and Carly just recently went on a trip to Washington and went up and saw my friends Josh and Izzy, who are originally from Australia, but now currently residing in Vancouver, Canada. And Mason proposed to Carly, and she said yes. So that's great. So congratulations, Congrats. Mason and Carly. We knew it was going to happen sooner or later. There was no question. Yeah. You, you guys are a textbook. Uh, no, not textbook, but you guys are perfect together. A couple we'll, goals. We'll put it. Sure. Yeah, we'll put it that way. Yeah, you guys are. Uh, you guys are amazing. So, congratulations to you guys. My friend Josh uh, is a photographer, and he photographed my good friend Pete Fox proposing to his girlfriend not too long ago, and had uh, set up with Mason to photograph Mason. Uh, proposing to Carly. So that's pretty sweet. So I, I've obviously joked, joked around with Josh that when the time comes for me, we're obviously going to have to secretly get out there. Mm -hmm. If my future wife is listening to this, it, the game like, it's up now. She'll, <laughs> if I ever go to Vancouver, Canada, I'm yeah. going to see my friend Josh. Hmm. Hmm. I think something's coming. Yep. Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. <laughs> um, yeah. So Riverside's coming up. I am in the process of making merchandise uh, for the TGC booth. We're going to be doing some collaboration products with the Governor's Club and Riverside. So I'm making some acrylic and leather key rings, similar to the Ocean City ones that I did last year. We're going to be making some TGC Riverside uh, 
Yeah, acrylic and leather. So basically this is a white acrylic that engraves black. If you guys go to my Instagram, you'll see some photos of them there. And they might have been in a story, so they might have been deleted by now. But acrylic and leather, uh, I make them myself, laser cut, laser engraved. I'm really excited about these. I'm only going to make them for this show. And once they're gone, they're gone. So come see us at the TGC booth. Corey's going to be there with me uh, at Riverside. We'll be actually in the end of the pavilion with Riverside. Mason's going to set us up in the same kind of the same like booth area um shirts have been ordered i actually put the purpose and passion logo on these shirts so this is almost like a even though purpose and passion is the governor's club we've kind of made a uh, a collaboration between the governor's club and purpose and passion so new shirts are ordered i'm going to have those available at riverside at the booth but they'll be available after the show too these aren't like an exclusive to the show type uh product so we'll have those soon i'll be posting photos of those on the instagram as soon as those are in hopefully in the next couple weeks boy what else shirts i'm going to do some mirror hangers probably some riverside tgc collaboration wooden mirror hangers as well we're, mm -hmm. we're gonna have some cool stuff available there and everything other than the shirts are being made in-house so that's that's like a cool selling point for those that all the hard goods i i make myself and uh the dually the dually is now registered we didn't, I didn't disclose exactly what truck it was on episode one, right? but I did on Instagram and we, we recorded episode one, basically an hour or two after the deal was done right? Right. Yeah. and it just accumulated the truck or Mason did for me down in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So it's a 1993 7.3 IDI, uh, turbo diesel Ford F350 crew cab, long bed, dually in a manual gearbox. And that was one of the top three to top five specification trucks I was looking for. I was I was really hoping I'd find a first gen Dodge with a twelve valve Cummins in it, in an extended cab, long bed, single wheel, and a manual. That was like the dream ish tow truck, I guess, tow rig. And I found a few, but they were just out of reach. They were like really nice examples, and they wanted a lot of money for them. Right. Yeah. And I found a couple of duallys. I mean, I ended up buying one, so I wasn't opposed to a dually. But I'd, I'd either find like a single cab, short box, dually, and I really need an extended cab or a four door. You just need, you just need that cab space. I I lived out of my single cab long box GMT four hundred for two years, and before I bought that enclosed trailer, I couldn't keep anything anywhere. You right. stack whatever you can behind the seat. I did a, I did put a toolbox in the bed, and that helped significantly. But yeah, it's hard to secure stuff in a single cab long box if you got a lot of stuff to carry. So I would have found I found like a few single cab uh, dually dodges, but then I'd pass because there were single cabs and I'd find one that was an extended cab, but it was an automatic and, and I could have bought those, but I stuck to my guns. I just, I wanted a manual when you're sitting in traffic towing, that can be a, a pain, but I just, I had to have a manual. I just, I had these, these memories of my, my father, my grandfather, my uncle who owns a paving company have these diesel manual trucks when I was a kid. And I just, that's what I learned to drive a manual on was an old Ford. It was a six, nine, mm -hmm. but a six, nine diesel manual F two fifty or something. And I just had to have one. So a few came and went budget would be a question and then configuration. Yeah. And so this one fell on my lap. It's, it's white, uh, nineties rig too. It's got the sun visor. It's got the running boards with the lights, under the under the cab with the running running boards, it's got uh, a fifth wheel hookup. It's obviously got a, a a frame you know hitch mount in the back too, which is what my enclosed trailer is. But it's white with the white visor, running boards. It's a manual seven three. It's got a Banks Sidewinder setup on it, so hopefully it's got you know a little bit more balls than uh, the normal seven three. Mm -hmm. And from what I read, and a lot of diesel nerds listening to this will probably correct me, but from what I remember. 93 was the first year of the 7.3 turbo diesel. Uh, I'm not sure if that was specific to the IDI or not, but 94, late 94 is the first Power Stroke 7.3. Right. So this one isn't a Power Stroke. It's the IDI International Motor. Were the Power Stroke Motors Internationals as well? They were, weren't they? Um, I think so. We could yeah, do I a, think they are. We could do a quick Google search, but I thought, yeah, I thought for some yeah, reason all the 7.3s are Internationals. Yeah, because Ford doesn't make a Power Stroke, like the Power Stroke engine. It's I'm pretty sure it's international. Hmm. Yeah. But did Ford make the 6.0 that had all the problems? No, I don't think they did either. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. Curious. Yeah, because my father had an 06 
F-350 extended cab, long box, single wheel. They bought brand new, white as well, automatic. And somehow must have been the luckiest man in the world with a 6.0 because he, he, he maintained it. I think all he did after market was a leveling kit. He in a, like one of those like cowl induction looking hoods mm-hmm. it doesn't have a scoop. It's like the reverse scoop. Right, and it yeah. was subtle. It was all paint matched. It looked really good. Really good looking truck had like the two inch leveling in the front. So it sat level and uh, didn't have any issues with that truck. He maintained it, but he didn't do, he didn't do like the head studs. He didn't do the EGR delete. I don't think he sold that truck in 2011 or 2012 with 50,000 miles on it for like $25,000. Yeah. And and didn't have any didn't have any issues with it at all. So my uncle Tim who owns a paving company, he lives locally here as well, had a same year 0660 that just was the worst thing that ever happened to him. Mm-hmm. He put motors and transmissions and just uh, it was just the worst thing ever. So most people have that experience with the six O's. You, yeah. You got to throw five grand or more into the thing, do a cab right, off. Right. You know? Once, once you get over a hundred thousand miles or you start tuning the engine and putting power to it, things fail quick. Yeah. It's crazy. And wasn't the oil cooler, like the oil cooler is a fail point in that cart, in yeah. that truck too, or in that motor, but it was all like underneath the intake manifold. The or EGR something? cooler is. Oh, that's yeah, what it is. It's okay. up top underneath the turbo. Yep. And, uh, yep. Yeah, I heard those are difficult to get at. So basically, from what I've heard, you basically have to take the cab off to... To do head gaskets, you do. Yeah, and at that point, you just do everything. Exactly, yeah. They make the bulletproof kit, and then it's a good truck. Yeah, yeah I've heard that too. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. I bought my Y33 Q45 off the guy that owns Green Earth Hybrid and Diesel down in yep, um, Sandown? No, it's in Chichester. Um, That's right, right on Route 28. Chris? <laughs> I can't Chris? remember his name. I don't remember his name. Well, his mom had a, his mom had a, uh, an anniversary edition, a 2000 Y33 Q45, and it was a Nash, it was a Nashville car. It was a Florida car originally. She lived in Nashville, then she came home, and decided to sell it. And rust free example. I mean, that's the car that I did an S13, S14 mm-hmm. suspension conversion in. I never saw it through to like a VIP status car, but that that was the plan at the beginning. But I went down and met him, and that's when I realized it was at a diesel shop. And so we got chit-chatting about my 52 cab over that we've got a 12-valve in. Mm-hmm. And so I was kind of picking his brain about 12-valve power and stuff. Mine's a P-pump motor. And we got talking about the 6.0s. I'm like, so what do you think? And he's like, I think it's one of the best diesel motors ever yeah. once you've got all the work done. Right, exactly. So I've heard that, yeah. And I, I still, even my uncle's like, doesn't matter what you put in it, things a piece of junk. Like, I mean, I mean, he, poor guy, he put, he put... 20 some odd thousand dozens of thousands of dollars into that one truck that one motor but yeah so i'm happy with my truck um i haven't had a chance to even see it in the flesh yet but mason drove it about an hour south to dalton after we recorded episode one uh, about a day or two after that he drove it about an hour from chattanooga down to his shop in dalton said the thing drove awesome no shakes no shimmies no sputtering the things he said it's smooth down the road i mean it's a one ton dually you know so i mean it's right. it's a 93 so it's not exactly a race truck but i'm so 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 excited to get down there and uh tinker on that thing we have to do glow plugs what else it's got a soft brake pedal i might have a friend of mason's down there look at that he he has like a a shop that basically specializes in brakes. So I'm just going to have him look at it and if they can sort it out for time's sake. Right. So we're not getting down there and like diagnosing and like fixing brakes. I'm hoping it's something as simple as just like a bad master cylinder and it's like bleeding through or right, leaking yeah. by or whatever. And we don't have to run. It's a, it's a, it's a Tennessee truck. So we, we have to remember it doesn't look like one of our trucks. Right. Like it doesn't have like rusty brake lines exactly. more than, more than likely. So I'm hoping that that's the case there. And yeah, so some just a little bit of maintenance, and it sounds like she's ready to hook on and go. It, it's got a it's got a seven way hookup for trailer brakes and lights and all that in the back that all works. The previous owner was towing with it, so, and it spent uh, sixteen to eighteen years, I guess, in the previous owner's hands. The guy before the guy bought it off of hauling hay. Lived on a farm, hauled a gooseneck open deck over trailer hauling hay. So it was just a farm truck. 170,000 miles on it. So that's 7.3. Man, that thing's not even broken in. Mm-hmm. Not even broken in. Uh, my Uncle Tim I had had numerous 7.3 diesels, and I was picking his brain about that truck as well. My dad did. You know, my dad owned a towing company for 40-some-odd years, and he had a 90... 
seven Ford F-350 one-ton tow truck, twin cable, single cab tow truck. That was a 7.3 Power Stroke. And my to this day, my dad still talks about that truck. Right. So I was talking to my uncle about it, and he sent me a link to some YouTube video of this 80-year-old man who had, or has, still has, like a 99 7.3 Extended cab, dually, kind of the same configuration as my truck, but I think it was just an extended cab, 7.3 with a million miles on it. Yep. I think the motor's been out or it's had a new motor once or twice or it's been built up, new heads or whatever, but it has the factory transmission, it's manual, and factory rear end. Yeah, so those have, insane. Those have not been rebuilt. And, and not just a million miles, it was like 1,360,000 miles. So it's <laughs> it's got almost double the mileage over a million than mine does now yeah which is kind of crazy so that that puts me to bed easy yeah you're like well yours should be good for quite a while at least as long as i want to own it so that leads me into uh our trip down to new york city last weekend yes long island uh i'm gonna turn my levels down real quick this is getting kind of distorted all right so Corey and i went down to long island new york last what was it last saturday yes last saturday and i was on the hunt for a sleeper cap for that truck like a 90s sleeper cap it's not a full cap most of you guys most of you guys know what i'm talking about it's not a full cap that goes the, that goes the whole length of the bed it just sits behind the cab on top of the bed and you use your opening window your back window of the cab to enter the sleeper cap and it doesn't go down to the bed the, the bed floor either it just sits on top of your bed and it basically is just that it's a bed. You put a mattress in there and you've got like windows in it and stuff. And we're not set up to like put anything on a screen here, but if you Google like sleeper cap, you'll see what I'm talking about. So I wanted one real bad because I've got a few friends that have them on like nineties, like bagged trucks and stuff. And I just had to have it. I'm like, man, it's a long bed. So even with a sleeper cap, it'll still look like a long right. truck. It's not going to eat up all the bed space. And even with the sleeper cap, you still have your full eight foot bed underneath the cap. So you can still carry a sheet of plywood or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I want one real bad. And the vision for this truck is like the nineties, like yeah. a nineties tow rig. It's already got the sun visor. It's got the running boards with the running lights. It's a, you know, it's a white crew cab dually Ford from the nineties. So I'm, I'm already opening Pandora's box with that truck. And I'm trying not to dude. I've got, I've got, I've got eight lug. 19.5 dually wheels yep. here that I bought from my cab over years ago and then decided not to use them. I tried selling them a couple of times and then nobody bought them. And at this point, I'm really glad I still have them because I want to get those powder coated white and put those on the dually. Yep. So yeah, it'd be awesome to lower that truck down a little bit. It's got that twin I-beam front end in it. So I've kind of looked at, they're not as easy to lower as like a Chevy. No, you buy drop not. spindles and springs and shocks for the front end of a Chevy and you're, you're five, six inches lowered easily. So I have looked online and I found some drop beams, like they call them like dream beams or yep. whatever. Yep. And that'll get you a few inch drop. And then I see guys taking a coil or two out of their springs to get it, you know, down a little bit farther. I've saved some photos of a crew cap dually I found with an axle flip in the rear and or a stack flip. And, you know, where they if for people listening, basically those trucks, the leaf the leaf spring stack in the back is on top of the axle. And when you switch those around and put the leaf stack underneath the axle, you get an immediate drop, obviously. So I've seen photos of a few dualies like mine with the axle flip in the back with the dream beams up front. And it looks amazing. It just closes up all that wheel gap. Mm -hmm. It's not slammed by any means, but you don't have any fabrication involved. Right. Just install, install some suspension components and you have to fabricate like a, like an axle cradle, you know, on top of the leaf stack or something, you know, it's like light stuff. It's not like we got to like, you know, four length the rear and notch the right, frame right. or anything like that. So we found with like a nineties, like a, a subtle build, I wouldn't call it a build. We talked about this on the last episode, but like a subtle, like nineties project haul rig. Yeah. Uh, put the word out that I was looking for a sleeper cap and the internet answered. And I think the first to get back to me was uh, this guy, Kyle, that I know who's actually local to here. And to be honest, when I put the word out on Instagram, I hadn't even looked yet. That's kind of why I put the word out. Right. I was busy working downstairs in the shop and I was like, I'll just post some photos, some really cool photos of some Ford Dooleys with a sleeper cap and then let the internet do the work for me. Right. Maybe somebody will be like, oh, I've got one or a friend's got one or something. And yet I, I kid you not within, within 30 seconds, within a minute, it was honestly within a minute, Kyle messaged me a Facebook marketplace ad 
for a white sleeper cap <laughs> in Long Island. And the guy, the guy only wanted a few hundred bucks for it. Super short money. And uh, yeah, we closed the deal. And once I even started a line of uh, communication with the guy, I had probably no word of a lie, probably 10 other people send me that same link. Like yeah. I found one and it's white. Right. Cause I'd already posted photos of the truck at that point and it's white. So who would have thought man, because that was the only one I could find that was for sale anywhere. I'd searched like all of new England and kind of places beyond. Not that I really wanted to drive anywhere beyond, but the word I put out on Instagram was we'll pick up if it's between here and Chattanooga, Tennessee. Right. Cause we're going to be renting a van up here, driving the TGC booth down to Chattanooga. And then ultimately, obviously bringing the truck and trailer home that same route. So I figured, well, maybe between here and Southern Tennessee, we'll find something. So Long Island, this guy's got a white one and he's available that weekend. And so you and I take the, uh, your new Toyota Tacoma, trusty Tacoma. I should have thought about measuring the bed of that tiny little truck against how wide that cap was. Cause he had, this guy had TIG welded. He had custom built this, this like slide out toolbox that was a bed rail to bed rail, or bedside to bedside toolbox, like a traditional truck mm-hmm. toolbox. He'd cut it down so it would sit within the bedsides yep. and sit underneath that sleeper cap and like fasten. So it would stay it would stay mounted while you were driving, but it was on rollers so you could roll it out from underneath the sleeper cap and you still had a toolbox to right. take up that underspace. So he had that too. And he had the original mattress. Like the it's like a it's not like a dirty mattress. It's like one of those like R V mattresses that has like the zipper with like the waterproof. it's like a vinyl. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like a waterproof mattress. So he had all that stuff with it. So we were halfway to Long Island until I was like, hold on. Is this even going to fit in the bed? Yeah. We didn't bring any straps. Total rookie move. Like we just hit the road. We're like, oh, we're going on a road trip. And just Six hours. Let's just go. <laughs> each way. Yeah. One day yeah, trip. Yeah, yeah. I had people asking me, like, where are you guys going to stay on the island? Because, you know, I've got a lot of friends on Long Island. And I'm like, we're not. We're just going to leave like at four in the morning, get down there for 10 a.m., pick the thing up, eat lunch, and then just drive home and be home for 5 p.m. And we were. We were yeah. home before five. Well, yeah. We're four o'clock. Pretty awesome. So we hammered down a uh, huge thanks to my friend, Brendan Schultz too, who actually went to uh, the seller's house to collect it for me. He was going in, f- the, the seller was going in for surgery on like that Thursday and he was having his rotator cuff operated on and something else too. And he wasn't sure how he was going to be feeling through the weekend and wasn't sure if he was even going to be home or something. So before that Thursday, Brendan uh, offered to go pick it up for me. That way he had it in his possession and we could, Definitely come down that weekend and pick it up. So huge thanks to Brandon for doing that for me. And I got to say thanks too to uh, my friend Greg, the Swoops, for even offering to pick it up too. Because Greg's up up in uh, Fishkill now. He's up on mainland, mainland New York. Mm-hmm. And his old shop's down on Long Island. And he even offered to scoop it up when he went down there too. But it worked out best for us to just go get it. That way we weren't making Greg run all over Long Island. So got the sleeper cap. Truck is now registered and insured, ready to go couple more weeks we'll get down there and we'll tinker on that we're going to be posting a lot of uh youtube content on that trip as well since we're going to be down there for a solid week and a half or more we're going to be posting a lot about the trip down itself prepping the dually for the drive home just our time down there too hanging out with people we're going to re- record what will more than likely be i don't even want to number the episodes because you and i might even do another one between josh garcia and mason right so we're going to do a, a podcast with mason and hopefully nikolai down there and yeah, and so we'll, we'll we'll try to capture as much of that as possible. I hate using the word vlog; it just sounds weird. But we try to vlog all of that stuff, and then the show itself, and then the trip home, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, we'll have a lot of content coming soon. Uh, it's kind of a dead space right now because we're in the middle of winter here, and uh, but we are getting going on a century. I say we. Uh, you're here today. Yeah, I'm getting going on a century. But today in particular. After we record this podcast, Corey and I are going to hit the shop. I have the Toyota Century in my father's garage right now, which is where I'm going to ultimately uh, work on that project. And if you guys look at the most recent upload on my YouTube channel, which is going to be just before this one, I have like a 20 minute episode of getting the Century in the shop and unboxing all of the products that I'm going to be using for the suspension in that project. So I unbox all the AccuWare products I got from them. Uh, the CVT endo tank, which in the video I described as being anodized black, but it's not. It's Cerakoted. Cerakoted. I yeah. should have gotten all my facts <laughs> straight before I recorded all that. But I opened the tank. I'm um, using their E-Level Plus system, which is their new management system. All that is finally in. I'm super excited to get into that. And the airlift performance hardware. Uh, I'm running their Dominator bags in the rear. 
I'm running their universal builder kit up front, which is going to require some fabrication. Got to cut the strut tubes off and weld the, uh, the new strut tubes on the airlift bags to the knuckle of the century and stuff like that. So there's some, there's some measuring and critiquing to do there. And yeah, so that episode covers all that as of right now. I haven't touched it yet. I've kind of just sat in the car trying to look to see where I want to put stuff, where I want to mount stuff, where I want the tank and yeah, where I want to mount everything. So maybe this afternoon we'll get that sorted out and maybe we'll even get some stuff mounted, get some stuff in the car and, and, uh, really dive into that. So century is on deck. I'm so excited. Finally, that thing's been sitting lying in wait for quite a while. Uh, Oh, and speaking of projects, you recently brought another car home didn't you of course <laughs> something you just couldn't live without <laughs> yeah tell us about that so yeah yeah I'll, I'll let you tell tell that because i didn't even know you bought a car until you posted a photo of it on instagram and i was like right on i didn't even oh, post it on instagram no that's yet. right yeah i mean what so what so what you trying to keep that one on the down low we don't need to talk about that if you don't want to no i just no i was just it it Honestly, all happened within a day. Um, cool. Well, so let me so, precursor you. I you posted now that I'm remembering it. You posted a photo driving with a trailer behind you. I did. That was all. It was. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. "Oh, are you going to going to yeah pick up something? I pick, I, I, pick I, up my other 190 because I still have the white and gray 190, um, which gets me into this story. So I, um, the white 190 basically needs some engine work. Um, and I've kind of been putting that off for a long time. And at this point, I just wanted to look for another engine just to throw it in, not mess around, not waste time. So I found another 190 that runs and drives and was clean and um, made a deal with the guy in that same day and grabbed the truck and trailer and went and got it. And um, uh, once I have it on the trailer and I got it back to uh, the shop I'm working at now, put it up on the lift and it's just as clean as my awesome. white one. Yeah. Cause I hadn't, so, I hadn't talked to you about that yet. So this right, is all right. news to me too. Cause I knew you got the right. 190, but I didn't know. Cause the last I talked to you, you were about to put it on the lift. So yep, that's exactly. awesome. So yeah, I put it up on the lift. It's just as clean as my other one. So now basically I'm going to pick one and finish it and then sell the other one. I, I suppose. The new one's red. It is red. Yep. It what is color? very red. What color interior? Uh, the tan leather. Okay. Yep. What color is the white one for interior? Gray leather. Gray. Yeah. Or, okay. Or vinyl, not even leather, but. Yeah. Huh. And they're both automatics. Yep. Yeah. Now, now what year? Well, okay. Well, rather than the year, what configuration is the red one? Is that a 2.3 as well? Or is it, that a two... It's a 2.3 auto. Yep. Oh, okay. I basically, I bought it as an engine to put in the white one, but the car ended up being just as clean. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, because now you've got a parts car for whatever one you want to... And the red one runs, right? Yeah, runs oh, and drives. I drove it. Man. Yeah. I say you just detail that thing and see what you're working with. That's pretty much where I'm at. Um, and and what, what's kind of crazy is I bought this car really cheap, and um, it already came with Euro headlights in it. Which That's right. The guy yep. had no idea. He was just like, yeah, the headlights are like glass or whatever. And I'm like, yep, these are nice, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have you looked to see if they're depots or like they washes? are depots? Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, those are good enough. Right. I right. ran depots. I ran depots in a few W one two fours and my one ninety. And I, I heard people arguing like, "Oh, I only put, I only put German products in my one ninety. And I'm like, "What? What tires do you have on your car? Yeah. Like, come on." So the depots, yeah, they're glass. They're not plastic. Right. I they're, put the I put the depot ones in my other one ninety. They're great lights. They yeah. really are. And they're so cheap. They're like two hundred bucks a pair. Exactly. You gotta you gotta you gotta rewire your pigtail. You yep. got to rewire your harness to go from the USDM lights to the Euro lights, but that's that's easy enough. I even saved a photo of the schematic of what where you mm -hmm. like where you run your wiring to. So anytime I get a one two four one ninety, just know what you're doing. Exactly. So that's awesome. I do remember the photo you sent me of the, having Euro lights already. Yep, that's cool. That'd be cool. You still have the Commonwealth kit. You I just do. need management now, though, right? Yep, I just need management. Um, you know what's sitting downstairs right now? What's downstairs? An airlift 3H setup with height sensors and really, yeah, I, that's that's um, and that's from Bag Riders. Oh, that's right. Yep. Okay. That's what was originally going to go in the Century, and I'm I'm happy that I'm still running airlift products in the Century. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, it couldn't be possible without. Well, I mean, it could be, but I'm really happy to be running airlift hardware in the Century. But I'm equally as excited to be running the AccuAir management in the Century mm -hmm. as well. So pairing with both those companies, they're obviously competitors because they both build management, but right. AccuAir doesn't actually make bags. So that being said, 
I still have the 3H system from Bag Riders, and I, I spoke to them not too long ago, and I was like, well, we could find another cool project for this. So that's kind of absolutely sitting on the burners. So we can figure that one out. But yeah, so what's the mileage? What's I, so you said you've driven it? Yep, yep, yep. I drove it. It's got 120,000 miles. Could, oh my goodness! Whatever. Yeah, that's. I what, mean, it, what, ne it needs some work. I've I've gone through it and made a list. I'm gonna do like brakes all around, obviously suspension because it's all wasted anyways. But yeah, that's perfect. Why so not? 120, man. That thing's that thing's that thing's ready to go. Now, what year is it? It's a 91. Okay, so and mine's a 92. So that's so. not a Jetronic then, is it? Um, uh, if you even really looked into it that far, I think it still is. I wasn't sure how long they ran the Jetronic. I don't Tronic remember. Yeah, it's it's the it's the um the later of the mechanical fuel injection yeah so it might be a form of jetronic i don't know if mercedes messed with the motronic systems in that in that car because mine mine was an 85 so it was an early model 84 was the first year 190 if i remember correctly mm -hmm. and mine was an 85 and that was a 2.3 as well jetronic but it had an eha valve up okay. under up underneath the bonnet took the bonnet off and there was fuel behind it. So it like regulated fuel in one way or another. I can't, I don't remember exactly what it did, but I started to deal with intermittent like power loss in the throttle. And it wasn't like a TPS issue or anything like that. And the more I dove into like the forums, I realized it, it, everybody pointed to this EHA valve. Hmm. And so I took it out and it's got like an adjuster on it. And I don't know if it adjusts the amount of fuel that goes by it or, or what. I'm kind of just talking out of my rear end right now, but I didn't adjust that at all. I had just heard that if you took it out and like cleaned the points on it or whatever and plugged it back in, that it would fix the issue. And it did. I'm going to do that a couple of times. Hmm. That's why I was curious what year yours was because you, you were saying you've driven it and kind of gotten a list down for the things that it needs. But yep. I'd be curious to know if in 91 they still had an EHA valve or that similar, yeah, mechanical injection on those cars. Kind of an odd odd system mm -hmm. and i don't think they ever carbureted those cars either i think they were no, always i think it was always later than that yeah it wasn't like volkswagen that carbureted stuff all the way through mm -hmm. all the way through the beginning of the mark twos well yeah that, i guess that was still mid 80s wasn't it did they ever carb mark twos um, here in the states i don't think so because late mark ones were all csi yeah that's right cis cis yeah and then they went Just to the cis -E. moment yeah oh, yeah <laughs> just been watching too much csi csi <laughs> miami or New York, or Las Vegas, or Vancouver. The original one was the only good one. We're bunny trailing. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, we have we have some Virgil's. Uh, what do we got? This is the zero sugar Virgil's root beer. I tried this for the first time, as did you, just the other week. Hey, yep. prost, 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 my friend. So, yeah, this is a uh, zero sugar root beer. Real excited about that because. Although I've cut a lot of soda out of my diet, we are bunny trailing now. <laughs> oh my goodness! I, I, the thing's been staring at me the whole time we've been we've been sitting down here, and we hadn't cracked into them yet, so it was time. But yeah, so I, although I don't drink a lot of soda anymore, root beer's been the vice, as we talked about on episode one too. Mm -hmm. Both of us are root beer nerds. But this Virgil's has a zero sugar now, and oddly enough, I like it better than the regular Virgil's. Yeah, it's a close call, but I I really enjoy it. So, I think that might be my go to for just like evening root beers because it's right. it's zero sugar. I mean, it's still not good for you. It's like just drink water. But <laughs> uh, the box, oh yeah, here we go. Zero sugar, zero anything artificial, zero aspartame, uh, zero guilt. It says. <laughs> Oh, God. non GMO. Yeah. It's good. There's yeah. a lot of worse things you could be drinking, for, I guess. But... For being a zero sugar soda, it's pretty good. Yeah. Well, where were we? We were talking about the 190 projects in general, your projects in general. What else are we going to cover? We can get into QA here pretty soon. Yeah, I think that'll cover everything else we we're going to cover. Yeah. I just had down here that we we're going to talk about um, starting on the century, which uh, we're obviously going to do after this. And uh, we're recording this on Saturday too, by the way. So hope all of you guys, you guys are hearing this Monday morning on your commute to work or while you're, while you're working, but hope you guys had a great weekend too, by the way. And uh, cause it's Saturday right now. And uh, we just had uh, a serious power outage in my area up here in the Lake region of New Hampshire last night. And we were out of power. My house was out of power for probably 
I don't know, a better half of 14 to 20 hours probably. I spent the night at my folks' house up the street because they've got a generator and they had the heat on and the TV was on and uh, Wi-Fi was still working for a little bit. I ended up pairing my phone to their TV so we could watch Netflix and stuff. So yeah, I spent the night at my folks' house in the guest bedroom, which is literally like 100 yards up the road. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had a pretty serious ice storm here last night. had a lot of wind and uh, we had a lot of snow and ice before the wind. And so obviously the wind brought all the heavy trees down. And uh, yeah, we, the whole town was black. Mm -hmm. My dad and I went to get fuel for the generator at about 10 o'clock last night. All the way through Meredith was black. All the street lights, traffic lights, everything. The uh, both, All three gas stations we have here in town are black. We drove all the way over to uh, Weir's Beach in Laconia to get fuel. But, but um, yeah, so that was my Friday night. Good Friday night in with my folks and their dog. And uh, the dog obviously slept on my bed with me because <laughs> she didn't know what to think. Cause you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I don't spend the night up there anymore. So yeah. So I hope you guys had a great weekend. I think what we're going to do now is we'll get into the Q and a, and I wrote down a lot of them. So you guys that are watching on YouTube, you see me, I've got my notebook in my hand. I am a typewriter nerd. And I used to, with my music, I used to write like lyrically write everything on my typewriter. I mean, I'd jot stuff down on my phone, obviously, if I thought of stuff while I was on the road or while I was driving or whatever. But I, I would always come home and transpose it over with my typewriter. It was very therapeutic for me. Just the mechanical connection to the typewriter, the clunk and the clanking, you know, bringing your paper back for the next line. Like it just, I loved it. And when I moved home from Nashville in 2012, I think it got lost in the shuffle of the move because I haven't oh, been able to damn. find it. I mean, that was eight years ago now, almost eight years ago. And so I've off and on been on the search for another mechanical, uh, I, I work, I using, uh, like a usable, I should say a usable working mechanical typewriter, one that I don't have to plug in, but one that I can still buy ribbons for. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't travel with it, but it's something that I can just kind of sit in the living room or here in the office or in the studio with. So since I don't have one of those right now, cause I'd love to have typewritered typed out like pages of notes for these mm -hmm. and have, it just feels more analog it feels more right. vintage so what i'm doing in the meantime is i've got this black leather bound notebook for those of you guys who just who are just listening on spotify or itunes and i laser engraved the purpose and passion logo into the leather cover of the notebook and i've been writing down not only my notes but all of the questions that are coming in on instagram and i did that all last night with the power out and it was just very therapeutic to sit down and write out. It's just, I don't know. When was the last time you wrote? Just sat down and wrote. I, I think you're kind of into it too. Though, yeah, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I see you posting some like story posts of like writing like lyrics and stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, I like then, doing that a lot. Yeah. I think, I think that's so, oh, it's important. I don't know. I miss it because I was in high school in the early 2000s. I graduated high school in 2003. So we were, obviously computers were around, but we were still, you were still like, writing handwriting oh, papers yeah right then once i graduated high school you know i i got right into my bmx career so i didn't go to college or anything i didn't i wasn't writing anything mm -hmm. so my handwriting has taken a few steps back in the last 20 years now so i uh yeah this will, if anything this will help me work on my handwriting mm -hmm. which is awesome but i do enjoy this so far i may not write out all the instagram questions every single time because i've got like i wrote down maybe 25 questions and as I said before, I won't go through all the questions that come in on Instagram uh, in the future with guests just to keep it short. But since you and I are just hanging out and we don't have anything really else pressing on the agenda, I'll go through these. And again, I didn't write them all down, but I think I wrote like 20 or 25 down. Mm -hmm. So let's get into these. And let's see if I can read my own handwriting. So King of Rollers, our buddy Jose Flores from Chicago. Jose asks, hey, fellas, would either of you guys consider building another old school Mercedes? What do you know? We just, of I'm, course. what did I say last time? We need to do all the questions first. I so know, then we can cover, we literally just got done talking about your 190. Yep. So depending on what you mean by old school Mercedes, we obviously just talked about how Corey's going to be working on, or we will be working on uh, his new 190 purchase. Yep. Which would be really fun because as most of you guys know, I had one as well years ago and I love that chassis. They're easy to work on and they're just so, they look so good. 190s yeah. look so good. It's we, a timeless I, car. I won't go into what you and I were talking about an hour ago. About yeah, I, that crossed my mind. Yeah, we'll probably leave that out. Whether smoke about that. Because yeah. if it doesn't come to fruition, then you didn't, because like, I, I feel like I, I, I call so many things out that I don't execute and then I'm like, eh, well... I guess I blew a lot of smoke for nothing no. on that one. But if that project comes together the way 
we were talking about it. Mm-hmm. That'd be pretty amazing. With a drivetrain swap and stuff. That'd be good. That'd be good. We don't say what. <laughs> so, Jose, yeah, so... Uh, Corey's working on one. Well, we we both will. You know, depending yeah. on what the year looks like and where we end up at the end of the year, we'll both be uh, working on that car. Hopefully, you're driving that thing by Ocean City. Oh, absolutely. Hopefully, I'm driving that thing in a couple months. Heck yeah, yeah. We're gonna be out of winter here in a couple months. So, yeah. for me, um, I mean, his question was, would you guys consider ever building another old school Mercedes? My answer is yes, 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 yes. I, I miss. I've owned probably. I mean, to be fair, maybe ten. Mercedes from the nineties. I'm not even, I don't think I've owned one in the nineties, eighties and older, mm-hmm. at least 10, maybe a dozen. And I miss every single one of them. Yeah. I just, as I mentioned before too, it's just something about looking out over that bonnet at the three pointed star. I just, I love Mercedes is probably, I said on episode one, that Euro Fords were some of my favorite like series of cars, but a vintage Mercedes is probably my favorite. You guys might even be able to see on YouTube here. I've got a hardcover book. To my left, you are right. That is the complete history of Daimler Benz, and that is like a 150, 200 page book of like the entire history of Mercedes. Obviously, we went to the Mercedes Museum. Yep. If we after this, if we talk about the Worthy trip a little bit, we'll cover that too because right. we, we visited the Mercedes Museum, and that was like, you know how freaking freaking out I was. I was like, yeah, I was like on the verge of annoyance, probably of how like unbelievably excited I was to be no. at that place. Um, so yeah, I would consider another old Mercedes. There's a few that I've got in mind. There's a few I mean, that I looked at R one Oh seven the other day. That's right. And we talked about that. Talked on about it. One. I'm still, uh, yeah, it still might happen. So I've, I've been, it's not old school. Well, I guess it is. It's retro. I'd, I'd say rather than old school, it's, it's retro, but I, I've been looking and you know, I've been looking for a very, very low number manual r129 right which was the successor to the r107 so it was the it was the early not early to mid 90s i think they even ran them through the late 90s two-door two-door uh convertible sports car that Mm -hmm. mercedes made that basically came from the pagoda so it's basically pagoda uh which was the w boy they shared the same platform as one of the sedans i think it was like w114 or 15 or something like that but Mm -hmm. it's pagoda the r107 yep and then the 500 SL, which is the R129. Yep. I want to do one of those in the worst way. And to be honest, they're not the best looking Mercedes in my book. That I think aesthetically, they they haven't quite sold me. But I've seen a few like race inspired ones and just really, really low aggressive wheel fitting ones. Right. And the more I dove into that car, like reading about them online and stuff, I realized that they did indeed. This is the thing. The thing I, I'm most frustrated about with Mercedes is through the 90s, they basically canned all manual gearbox Mercedes. Right, exactly. Like all of them. The the 190, you could get in a manual. You could find the W124s in a manual. They're super rare in the States, but I've seen them. I've even seen an S124 wagon in a manual here in the yeah, States. Yeah, I think I have too, yeah. And they're super rare. I mean, I can probably speak for everybody that when you're looking for one, you just want to find a manual. But they did make a manual R129. I don't remember off the top of my head because I didn't know we were going to talk about this before how many, but I've heard from anywhere between like 100 and like 250 ever, like worldwide manual R129 and R129s. And here's the kicker. They were all dogleg boxes. Right. So, So they've got the Cosworth dogleg box. And if you guys aren't familiar with what a dogleg gearbox is, is they're set up for road racing basically um or gt racing or whatever you want yeah. to call it, circuit racing and first gear is down towards you and you cross your pattern up to second and straight back for third since second and third gear are the two gears you're most you're mostly transitioning between while on the track so you're hammering between second and third and they're in line with each other so the r129 manuals from what i've read are all dogleg manual cars and to me that's just such a cool oem you know, thing to that car. So that, I think that's the main reason why I've been interested in finding a manual R129. And you still go and check every, every single one we see. Yeah. I'm glad you said it every single time Corey's with me and I do it when I'm alone. If I see an R129, just in a parking lot, even if it's not yeah. for sale, just someone's car just sitting over there in front of the gas station. I'll walk over and look in the window because if it's a manual, I'm waiting around for, till the owner yep. shows up. Cause I got to see if it's for sale. Cause they, they, I passed on one in Vermont. 
I might have even Mike Cashman. Mike Cashman might have sent me a link. Oh, no. It was a photo that a friend of his sent him. There were two for sale in Vermont, side of the road. Guy was just driving by, and one of them was a manual. He wanted like five grand for it. And that was it. That was it. And I was like, nah, I don't have five grand to spend right now on a car. And I didn't know how rare the no. manuals were. I would have scooped it. You never know. Uh, when we went to the Mercedes Museum in Stuttgart, the Mercedes, uh, what was it called? It's the Mercedes Classic Center. Mercedes-Benz Classic Center. It's like a, it's like a separate entity from the museum. Yes. They store, and they've got a museum of their own, basically. They've got like a, a paddock full of vintage Mercedes cars, separate from the museum. But they rent space out in the parking garage underneath the Mercedes Museum and park some of their cars down there. So when we arrived to the Mercedes Museum in Stuttgart, Germany, we pulled down below into the parking garage, and there was an R129 sitting next to a few like W108s. And it was clear that these were the Classic Center's cars. Mm-hmm. If that's what the classic center is called, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And so I obviously, I, you, dude, you remember because I was talking to you specifically. I'm headed over to it and I'm saying, what are the odds, or what do you like? What would you guess that this one out of them all is a manual? Yeah. And I looked in the window and it's got three pedals and a shifter. I couldn't believe it. I've got photos of it. I took photos through the window and yeah, yeah, to like oh, yeah. to like validate the fact that I actually saw. And sure enough, you could see the the gear layout on the shift knob, and it was indeed a dog leg. Oh my gosh, what a cool car! Well, that's enough. We're still on question one, but yeah, a, a, a dog leg R129 would be really cool. I'd really like to dive down uh, the hole with one of those things. Mm-hmm. So, let's see. Never finishing projects. Never underscore finishing underscore projects. Uh, favorite place to stop for food on your travels one east coast travel once you get south of i mean this this line may not be accurate but for me once i reach maryland once i reach maryland and point south of maryland waffle house yep waffle house that place i'm telling you i know you don't like it the way i do i know because (laughs) when you when you kyron and i when you kyron and i stopped at a waffle house in like tennessee on our way across country in the e23 we were filming for the YouTube thing. Right, that's right, and, yeah. and I filmed us when we sat down, and I'm like, we're at Waffle House. You know, we stop at everyone we can stop at, blah, blah, blah. Then I went to the bathroom, and Kyron filmed you, and he's like, what do you think of Waffle House? And you're like, I don't know, man. It's all right, I guess. And I'm like, I was, when I was editing that, I didn't even know you guys filmed that. When I was like yeah, editing yeah. it later on, I was like, oh, man, the disappointment <laughs> overwhelmed me. But yeah, I know, I, I get it, man. It's, it's Waffle House. <laughs> it's so good, though. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let's be clear here. All I get at Waffle House, literally all I get at Waffle House is a plain waffle, maybe hash browns, like, covered. Right. Whatever they call it with the cheese on loaded. it. Loaded. No, I don't get it loaded. I just no. get it covered. Just it's cheese. Because it's just some crappy piece of, like, single-wrapped, like, cheese product or something. You know what I mean? It's like the yellow cheese piece product. of, like, American cheese product, like the Lando Lakes. Yeah. Like, individually wrapped. Yeah, it's one of those. But anyway, I get a plain waffle, maybe a hash brown covered with a sweet tea and a coffee any time of day, any time of night. That's it. That's all I get. And I've got good, I've got a good track record with that. Like with my health, I don't, I don't feel like dying afterwards. I did. I got like a, a burger from there once when I was living in Tennessee and it just made me feel awful for a few days. So I stick to a waffle and that's it. So I won't argue with anyone that says waffle house is gross and greasy and I won't argue there. It is. That's exactly what that food is, but I have a waffle there. But it's just, it's still your go-to. Yeah. And I've heard, I've heard they use like what's it like cake batter and like cream instead of milk. Oh, that's for all right. The, yeah. Oh yeah, the waffles are just so good, man. Yeah, they they know all the all the rules. Um, Waffle House, and if I'm on the West Coast or anywhere west of like Dallas, it's In and Out for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess to put it in a general way, good food, right? Like not excluding Waffle House and In and Out. I think my favorite food while I'm on the road is like good food. Like if we're in the South, it's awesome to find some local barbecue joint. Right. You not, know, not chain places. That's it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. What about you? Standouts? Um, that place in Palm Springs. What was it called? How dare you for forget Elmer's. There you Elmer's. go. Yeah. yeah. Elmer's. Elmer's. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? I mean, there are, yeah, like, like we talked about all the small, you know, non-chain yeah. places that you, you go to and you're not expecting it. And the food is just phenomenal. I don't know if you had like a, like a guilty pleasure spot. Like for me, Bojangles is included in that too. Yeah. Because we don't have Bojangles anywhere around right. here. We don't have any good, we don't have any good like Southern chains up here. 
like fried chicken joint chains. Mm. And so Bojangles does it for me. Zaxby's is a close second. I've had, you know, I've had good and bad experiences at both Zaxby's and Bojangles, but um, I've had more bad experiences at Zaxby's than I have Bojangles. But a few pieces of like fried chicken tenders with mac and cheese and a biscuit and a sweet tea is just, oh, I don't eat as much of that stuff as I used to. Yeah. Like I've really cleaned up my diet. I mean, as you know, I lost 30 pounds two years ago, mm -hmm. cleaning up my diet, cutting a lot of bread out and a lot of sugar out and stuff. And, uh, but I still love that food so much. Right. So now that I don't eat as much of it anymore, when I do, I'm like, I'm in seventh heaven like <laughs> eating that food. So yeah, so Bojangles, Waffle House, in and out any cool local like barbecue joints. It's harder to find like good Chinese restaurants when you're on the road. Oh yeah. They don't stock up near the highway or anything like that. But I, I think you and I were talking about it the other night. I think my favorite food on earth is like a really good general gals or general sows chicken with like pork fried rice. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's so good. And I, I'm not a glutton, but I know like, I know how I can relate to how people feel like people who have actual eating problems, like with, it's like comfort food. They eat to feel better about themselves or about life in general. Like just eating food makes you feel good. Right. When I eat a good general sows or general gals chicken, I just, I just genuinely feel amazing with life. I'm like, life can't get any better. This food is so good and I just wish it was bottomless and I wouldn't throw up and die <laughs> or get fat. So anyway, yeah. So those are some of our favorite food spots on the road. Moving forward on the questions, uh, Andrew underscore J underscore Brown asks, reliability of your previous air suspension systems. Um, good. Uh, everything from early early setups I had from uh, like electronic ASCO valves with momentary push button switches to the Airlift 3P and 3H system to hopefully with this new Acura uh, E-Level Plus system. Uh, I've never had any issues recently when I was in Florida, when I was in, I've never had any issues with a blown airline. When, when I, I'm no expert, but when I, when I bag a car, I'm trying to be methodical about everything. So I'm running my airline in areas that don't have a lot of heat or don't have any moving parts. Don't run it over a control arm. that's going to be moving, right. you know, especially when you air out. Cause yeah, you can look at your range of motion while you're driving that control arm may just go up and down. But when you air out, that thing's going to crank way up top. So I try to do my best to avoid those. I've never had a blown airline, even though I carry union PTCs, I carry extra wine, I carry extra wine cutters. I carry everything in those cars in, right. in case you do, you know, extra fittings in case you like do have some sort of malfunction, you can fix it and keep going. Um, but recently when I was in Florida with the Corvair, I recently started blowing my, uh, my key power fuse at my battery for the airlift system. So I haven't looked into why that is, it's a 30 amp fuse and it was the original fuse that had been in that car since 2015. So it's a five year old fuse. Right. To be fair, I did pop one more while I was still down there. So I haven't looked into it any farther, but I think the second one I put in there was a 20 amp. So I think that one popped cause it was a 20 calling for a 30, Right. but I put a 30 in and, and finished the rest of the trip off, you know, cruising a one a and Daytona for like four more days or something like that without any issues. So that's the only, so to answer your question, reliability for me, has been amazing. And I dailyed my 190, which was on air. Like I dailyed, I didn't daily through the winter. I know you drove your Avant. Yeah, into the some only cold. bad car I've had, but yep. yeah. Into some Airlift cold months. Yeah. Um, but I daily drove my 190 for a solid year with the exception of winter. I think I finished that car in early spring and owned it through late fall and uh, drove it everywhere and never had any issues with the suspension ever. So yeah, it's reliable. As long as you have your system set up, not to say you won't deal with any like compressor issues or you know i don't know there's you can yeah it's it there's more variables to air suspension than there is coilover obviously right with a coilover you've got you've got two mounting points usually you've got a shock that could obviously blow or leak or whatever and you, or you could like break a coil or something that's it right. with air suspension you have a lot of moving parts and a lot of stuff that has to be powered and running relays and fuses and stuff like that so yeah it just comes down to prep though exactly yep oh and just going over all your stuff making sure you've got everything sorted out let me see. Moving on. Right hand drive. Jonathan RHD underscore Jonathan says, do a static versus air ride debate. Well, we don't have to get into a massive debate about this, but I think you and I both can attest to both. Oh, it depends on the car. Absolutely. It totally does. I mean, 
as you know, and most people that know me have known me for the last 10 years, I was a static warrior, man. Oh, yeah. I, I, if, if I had stayed on Twitter or, or like kept all my Instagram posts around, there would have been some posts lingering out in the ether about me bashing air ride <laughs> when I was younger. Cause like the Fox wagon, you know, like I was so proud that that car like drove on the belly, right? you know, like rerouting fuel and airlines and, and raising the motor and uh, that car just, yeah, I, I love a static low car, which is why I absolutely love the Japanese VIP scene. Right. I love, I love I don't care how much camber, seriously, a stock body, full body Toyota or Nissan with high offset wheels with like negative 18 degrees of camber tucked up in there driving on the belly. I love it. I've got no shame in it, <laughs> but I love open wheel model a hot rods too. Right. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, but I love like Sasamoto's Y33. All right. You guys that are listening and I'll, I know a lot of you guys aren't into this. I get it. It's an aesthetic thing. It's a safety thing too. I mean, that's why right. I've never built a car with that much camber. I want to, you know, I, I like the look of camber, especially if it's uniform front and rear. But you got to be safe too. You know, you can't be stupid. But Sasamoto Sans Avex Y33 with the gulling doors, front and rear doors are all gulling, right, or right. not gulling, but they're Lambo doors. Yeah. yeah. That car static, it's got, it's, I, I'm pretty sure he's running T demand everything. He's running the T demand front cross member. It might all be custom to his specific car. I thought it was all T demand stuff though, but like that car drives on the belly and he's, he's, he's rebuilt the undercarriage and suspension of that car. Like numerous times but that car has been around for like 10 or 12 years. And so I dive deep on both realms. I love, love, love a static VIP car with a lot of camber. I love a small little like Mark one or Mark right. two. Um, yeah, like there's a handful of cars you can think of off the top of my head. My buddy Jake Looney. Looney, I hope you're listening to this, man. You guys remember the Purple Civic that was driving around, the hatchback Purple Civic on 13s? He had 100 spoke Dayton's on that thing for a little bit. I was following him into FDR Park in Philadelphia for like a Toys for Tots event back in 2013 and watched him rip his gas tank open on just dirt. Like it wasn't even dirt. He was driving on the asphalt. It was just like pebbles in the road mm -hmm. or something and literally just started spilling fuel out everywhere and obviously that isn't safe either but i just i like a static low car just especially when it's got a tight fender to lip fitment and the fenders are perfect mm -hmm. you got your spring rate right yeah and it's just yeah i don't know i mean i guess there's something to be said for the beat up ones too they just they just static warrior it but but like you said it all depends on the car like my century like why would like i would never static drop that car. right or my 1960 Mercedes or the Corvair, really the Corvair would be a pretty sweet car actually to be static and just belly up, bellied on the ground all the time. But it's nice to have, it's nice to have the, like the option of being able to raise the car when you want to put it on a trailer, when you want to, when you cruise ocean city, Maryland. Yep. If you've, if any of you guys have cruised ocean city, Maryland in a low car, you know that getting off the strip, the strip sits lower than all the land around it. So if you want to get off the strip up in your hotel, up into a restaurant, just anywhere you have to climb up out of the strip and it's pretty aggressive in, in a lot of different parking lots or different roads. So yeah, having, having air suspension gets you it, and it protects your car. If you got some, like my BMW E23, I had that non fog light BBS valence up front of that thing, super rare front splitter. And if that thing was static, I would have destroyed that thing 10 times over probably. Yep. So yeah. Um, I guess that could be an air versus static debate. I like them both. I really do. Um, I, I still thoroughly enjoy seeing a car that's super low and someone else says, Hey, you know, that's static. Right? Yeah. And I'm exactly like, Oh, it which, is. That's yeah. crazy. It's that's kind of always, I, I think I like that the most yeah. where you're walking around a car, admiring like other parts, you're admiring all sorts of different things, not just it's fitment or it's ride height, but you just assume it's aired out. Mm -hmm. And then someone's like, yeah, you know, that's so-and-so's car. It's static. And then you start looking at like the fitment and the fenders right. are perfect and the paint's perfect. And you're like, Oh, um, taxi. Yeah. Oh my, yes. <laughs> I, knew, I was going to mention that a minute ago. <laughs> um, yeah. Just search. Uh, is it taxi I underscore? I think it's underscore taxi. Yeah. A friend of ours in England has a Mark one, a built Mark one rabbit, Mark one golf. Technically that Ben Walker at players classic was like, you know, that car is static. Right. And I was like, no, nah, there's no way it's static. And it's on, it's a legit built car. It's a G60 swap, right? Supercharged. G40. Or G40. It's supercharged G60, regardless. Yeah. Um, Alex Wright. Yeah, shout out to Alex. Taxi underscore. Taxi underscore. I couldn't remember where you had your underscore, Alex. So he's got a supercharged Mark One Golf on BBS, like E76s or something. 
I don't remember. They're like Motorsport, like Magnesium BBSs. Yeah. Fender to Lip Fitment. Perfect. Like literally aired out and the fenders are perfect. And he drives it everywhere. Yeah. Oh, that thing's so good. It's so good. Yeah, search Instagram, taxi, T-A-X-I underscore. And you'll see exactly what we're talking about as far as a ridiculously low static car that just looks like it should be on air for how good the body is. And he drives it all over England. He did a pull by us on the highway on our way back to Ben's up north in in England. He did a... Oh, and then I think he... Then he like texted me and was like, it was not running quite right right now. I'm like, trust me, it looks and sounds fine. Yeah. And that thing was getting out of its own way for sure. Yeah, so that's our air ride versus static debate. Jack Mason, jck.msn, asks, where did you learn your fabrication skills? Uh, mine's pretty easy, my father. Because uh, growing up, he's the one who owned the welder in the shop. Mm-hmm. And uh, mostly MIG. Most, well, okay, well, he asked fabrication, not necessarily welding specifically. But yeah, fabrication skills was to me in three topics could be chalked up to my father just doing it or mm-hmm. like learning like yep. trial and error, you know, like trying to design something that doesn't work. So, Oh, that needs a gusset or that needs like triangulation for strength or whatever. Or third, the internet. Yep. YouTube. Yep. It's a, there's so much stuff. You don't, man, if you want to learn fabrication, just, just go into YouTube. There's yeah. so much, not just watching people build cars or build stuff like, but just there's actual videos on teaching you how to do that stuff. I don't know. What about you? Where'd you learn your fabrication skills? Yeah. Just mostly doing it. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah. No, there's something to be said for learning it on the ground floor, you know, right. in yeah. a shop. Yeah. You know? Just been, I've been a tech forever and yep. oh, I need to build something. You can't buy it. And that's where I get, build it. that's where I get envious of you in that case, because if I've like with the dually, for example, I bought right. that F350. I've never owned a seven, three diesel and it needs glow plugs. So when you were here last weekend, I was like, you ever do glow plugs in a seven, three. So I looked on YouTube and obviously watched a guy do it. And I'm like, right. Oh, they're right on top. That's yep. awesome. I'm like, Oh, the Chevys are down underneath. Right. Are- and you're like, yeah, the <laughs> Chevys are down underneath. And, and so, yeah, so that's where I get envious where the last 12 years, obviously I've been doing other stuff and you've been doing other stuff. So it's cool where, I'm like, you ever worked on a 7.3? And you're like, yeah, quite a few. And I'm yep. like, perfect. <laughs> so that's where you learn stuff from your friends, you know, because everybody's doing something different. And it all, it all like works out at right. some point, you know, it all, it all works out. So moving forward, I don't, unless you've seen this name spelt out, um, it'd be difficult for most people to uh, pronunciate it because uh, this is a uh, IFA. Oh, yeah. It's A A O I F E, But... Aoife, uh L1, so her Instagram is A-O-I-F-E-M-A-L-1. She came out to our Phoenix TGC meet with a really cool Ford 100. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't remember if that was a British one or a mainland Europe one. Regardless, it wasn't a U.S. It was, it's, a, it's a European Ford. It's a little like Anglia for the most part. It's a cool little like sedan, tiny little thing. Yeah. She went, she pulled it out of storage to drive it to our TGC meet in Phoenix and it hadn't been on the road in, I don't know, I want to say years, yeah, yeah. maybe a year or something. It was in storage regardless. Started it up and headed down the road and didn't even make it a block and the thing like, like violently overheated. Like apparently it was just like spewing, cooling out everywhere and the thing was just tacked right out. So her and her boyfriend put it on the trailer and trailered it to the meet with their Land Cruiser and, and it was just so cool. She showed up and she was just like, I just, I had to come. So we, we had to bring the car. Yep. We started, we got the car out. We had to bring it. So that was amazing. Her question is from the TGC tour, which state would you say has the best taste in cars? Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> I mean, they, her, what she went through to get that car to come hang out with us and to bring the car out says almost everything I need to say in response to that. Um, but, I don't know. Uh, uh, it's every every city we stopped and had its own, you know, yes. its own feel, its own vibe. It it'd be impossible to pick one. Uh, I yeah, think. yeah, I agree with that. Everybody everybody has their own like crew and their own style. That's what I love most about the automotive thing. This whole automotive thing that we're doing mm-hmm. is the diversity in it. If we all did the same thing and all built the same car or whatever, it would get pretty boring pretty quickly. But I don't know, Aoife. I, that's a good question. S- Southern California has a really cool scene because there's like 
there's a lot of money out there too. So you see all sorts of like high-end wool rider stuff and import stuff, a lot of Japanese stuff because that's easier to import to the West Coast. But yeah, I don't know. Goofingly, I say Phoenix because that's where you're from and you did a lot. You went through a lot to get your car to our meet. <laughs> uh, Daniel, let me see if I can read this one. My handwriting's awful. Daniel... ITO Sway with an E, S W E Y at the end. Any favorite wheels of the 90s? Well, for me, luckily I was able to own one of my favorite sets of wheels from the 90s, and they were on my E23. And those are the Ronal made, not the OZ Racing, which came later, I think, but the Ronal AC Schnitzer Type 2 three piece racing wheels. And those were uh, aluminum, obviously, but they were um, titanium hardware. Yep originally and they were oem plus specs for e46s i think the e32 sevens because i think i think ac schnitzer tuned and packaged an e32 seven series yeah I think and so. i think the e31 the eight yes, series i think right. those wheels came on the eight series too but i know for sure they came on e46s BMW nerds more than me at least will know better than me but yeah i think the ac schnitzer type two it's a five spoke like five spokes just looks so good and you can put a five spoke on any car and, mm-hmm. and it looks good. So that'd have to be my, that, yeah, that's my ranking right off the top yeah. of my head. I don't know about you. What do you, what do you think? <sighs> There's so many. There is so many. I mean, one, um, one that comes to mind right away, Autostrada Modena. Yeah. Ryan Stevens is out of set and he won't give them to me. Does he still have them? Yeah, he still has them. He's, they're sitting in his basement doing nothing. Hmm. Gonna have to, <laughs> persuade him in one I think, way or another. I think every time I see him, I, I bug him about him because those would look good on the 190. Oh, of course they would. Are they 17s? Yep. Oh, for sure. I had 16s on mine and that fender to lip, I was laying control arm out. Mm-hmm. So fender to lip with the Modanas on 17s, you'd still you'd still be, you'd be a half inch off the ground. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that, those are our picks right at the top of our head. Yeah. Gilly Built, our buddy Eric, who's also from here in New Hampshire, asks... Now this now, Eric has a an LS powered FCR X7, so this this makes sense with this question. When are you going to build a fast car, and what would it be? Well, the first part of that, I'm not sure. Uh, owning old and comically slow cars keeps me out of trouble and the graveyard. Yes. So I like slow cars because. I've heard other people say this, but driving a slow car fast is way more invigorating than driving a fast car fast. You know what I mean? Like you're living on the edge of your, like everything's like coming apart and you're revved right out and it it feels like the car is going to fall apart onto you and every corner you're just like, you know what I mean? Like driving like a little four cylinder powered gutless car just as hard as you can go is way more like, rather than like a you know like a gt3 porsche you just ease on that throttle and you're like oh what? yeah i mean they obviously all have their own feel but uh it, to answer eric's question i don't know when that will be but what would it be um it would it would be one of two things off the top of my head it would be a late 60s gm muscle car because that's just what my dad had when i was a kid he had 396 chevelles he had big block uh c2 corvettes he had uh, he had a few small block Novas that were like pretty serious in the quarter mile, but they were license plate cars, you know, stuff that he drove on the street as well. So I'd love to, at some point dive into my childhood and build one of those cars or, you know, assemble one of those cars. Um, but I wanted to do an Evo two tribute on my one ninety. We talked about that on episode one. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to do a Mercedes V eight swap and emulate one of the Judd V8 like hill climb 190s yeah. or a DTM car, but the DTM cars were four cylinders. But if you guys YouTube Judd V8 Mercedes 190, you'll see like the car I'm talking about. It's a hill climb car with a Judd V8 in it with like a Jericho or like some sort of like sequential gearbox. And the thing, yeah. it's a high revving V8 and the thing just sounds so nuts. And the thing's got to go like a bat out of hell it's got to so i'd love to do a 190 with like an evo 2 or like serious wide body hill climb car with a v8 in it and you and i were talking about this earlier it'd be way cheaper to go to a summit catalog and do an ls right but it'd be really cool to have an oem a full oem car where you've got a mercedes v8 power plant too yeah um 
Yeah, so that, that'd have to be mine for the fast car. Um, Notch Jack, my buddy Jack from uh, England. Mm -hmm. He's got a really sweet notch back on BBS splits. Uh, he says, when, uh, when, no, not when, are you going to do another TGC pop-up meet this year at Players Classic? And will you do key rings again? I'm really hoping we're both there for Players Classic again, Jack. Uh, it was awesome to hang out with you last year at Classic. I've done Classic four years now. You did last year with me. Yep. We'd love to go. We were talking about this earlier. We've got a lot of movement on the Russia trip in July, and our plan is to still come to Poland for racism or ultra race uh, the weekend after Players Classic. So we'd really like to be in the UK for Players Classic and then head over to Poland on that same trip for uh, ultra race. So yeah, in that, if if we go to Players Classic, yes, we'll do a TGC pop up meet, and yes, I'll have some exclusive merchandise for that meet. So that and that that would help justify the trip to Classic is to do another meet and get all you guys together and and hang out with you guys. Otherwise, you're gonna have to. <laughs> otherwise, you're gonna have to haul that notch back all the way across Europe and see us in Poland. Mm -hmm. Moving on, Tom Caffrey, our buddy Tom, yep. who did the Worthy Z trip with us two years ago. Tom asks. Uh, to both of you, which cars have you sold that you miss the most? Uh, I'll let you answer this one because I answered this last episode. Mm -hmm. And it's a toss-up between my E23 7 Series BMW and my 1960 Mercedes. Um, I'd say about 10 or 11 years ago, I had a um, I had a, another Audi B5 and it was Cactus Green. I remember that car. Yeah. And at the time... I didn't realize how rare the cactus green was. So yeah, I would definitely take that car back. That was like static on 17s, right? Or something like that. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. right. I remember that car. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, so moving right forward, uh, our buddy Zach Wilson from Bag Riders asks, I think the best question. I should have saved this one for, for the last. Actually, you know what? I will save this one. Zach, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this one. We'll come back to it. T Nom Rev asks plans for the f-350 drop in semi wheels <laughs> i'm telling you, we gotta add we gotta go through I the know. questions first because we already touched on this yeah um yes and yes uh i want to drop the 350 a little bit it's not first on the list i gotta get through the century first and i'd really i really need to get some work done on my cab over if i'm looking to move at the end of this year i need that cab over like running and yard driving but yes i'd like to drop the 350 like subtly like do an axle flip drop beams like we talked about in the mm -hmm. front and I've got 19.5. I've got eight log 19.5 wheels here that I'd love to run. You can't run small rubber on those because you can't mill them down like you can 22.5 and 24.5s. But uh, it's you know what I'd notice? I never even noticed. It's got 16 inch Alcoas on it. Oh yeah, the 350 now. Yeah, they're just not polished out. Those right. things will mirror shine out. So yep. I might keep the Alcoas on it or put my 19.5s on it. But yes to both those questions. Uh, Veely, my buddy, Matt Veal from England. I don't think you've met Matt yet. Matt came to both of our TGC meets in England. We did in 2015 and 16 mm -hmm. before you went over there with me. Excuse me. And, uh, Matt had, I'll show you photos afterwards. You might've ever even seen the photo. Uh, Matt had this awesome S124 with a body kit. I think it was an AMG kit. I might be wrong there, but he had a bagged S124 Mercedes wagon on Meisters. Oh, okay. It, it, was, it was like a light colored car. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal looking car. And he had a first gen Cressida. Oh, dang. Like a Shakotan style Cressy. He said, uh, what part of a build is the part you most look forward to? This is going to be a, this is a bad answer, but it's, it's the truth. So I got to say it. It's the end. Yeah. It's the end for me. Like, I wish I enjoyed the process more than I do now. I think I enjoy it more now than I did before. But like, I, I, I like the end, like the part of the build I, I most look forward to is backing it out of the shop for the last time, airing it down or whatever, even if it's static on wheels, all done and sitting in my driveway. Mm -hmm. That's what I look forward to the most. It's like the end goal. The, and uh, and the I unveil. hope, yeah, the unveil to, to myself, the unveiling right, to right. myself, you know, no one else included, no internet hype or anything, just like seeing it for myself outside the shop from like 50 feet away. Uh, and I hope, and this is being honest, I hope in the next few years I can say the process is what I look forward to the most. Right now, it's the beginning and the end. I most look forward to the chase and acquiring the car and being able to like afford it or purchase it or whatever. And then it's the very end when it's all done. And you can look at your before and afters, like the Lada, the E23. Some of those cars were like serious 
you know, transformations aesthetically. Right. Mm-hmm. What about you? What's your favorite? Uh... I mean, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. The, the final product when you can sit back and, and appreciate all the work you've done and it's, you know, the vision is complete. Um, I may have a little bit different view because I've built a lot of cars for other people. So I've, yeah, I've, come, shop. I've come to appreciate the, you know, taking the small steps during a, a build or the process. And, yep. You know, it's easy to say that you've, you've well easily worked on, but you've quote unquote built m- way more cars than I have. Cause that's your job. Yeah. 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 You work on cars. I mean, and as I mentioned before, it's like, I only do it when I've got a project myself on the burner. So that's again, where I get envious where it's like, Oh, I've seen one of these before and you can do this, that, and the other thing. So moving on, uh, our buddy, William, who sent in a question last, uh, last episode, he's from Phoenix. He brought out that static low light gear, a really cool car. Mm-hmm. As we we're talking about static cars bellied on the floor, deluxe low light Gia is his name on Instagram. He asks, are you coming back to Arizona? Please bring your BMW to a Volkswagen show here in Arizona. And will the 700 and Corvair fit in your enclosed trailer? Um, one, yes, I'm definitely coming back to Arizona. It's not going to be this winter, unfortunately. I wish it was because that's the best time for us to come out there. Uh, I'd love to bring the BMW, the 700, out to a VW show out there. It's just you guys are so far away. <laughs> Even if we move to Chattanooga, Tennessee, you're yeah. still just almost just as far away. Uh, and no, I don't think the Corvair and the 700 will fit in my trailer. But two 700s will definitely fit in the trailer. Yes. Because that... The 700 is longer than it looks. It looks, you know, it's it's tiny width wise and it's tiny height wise. It's tiny in every way, but it's 11 feet long. So it seems that sounds that sounds long for how long it actually looks. But I've got a 24 foot enclosed trailer, so yeah, two 700s would fit would fit in the end yeah. in that trailer. Corvair is kind of a long car, mm-hmm. so no, they wouldn't fit. Luke Duville. Uh, asks another question in this episode. He said, what's your opinion on, quote unquote, that side of H2O? And do you ever see it becoming smaller again? Um, I don't see it becoming smaller again. I, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but it seems like it's getting crazier every year. In my opinion, see, I'm not a partier, so we aren't we aren't like in the middle of the mayhem on Friday and Saturday night. We usually stay up in the higher numbers, up mm-hmm. out of the melee, we like cruising with our friends, just hanging out. So any YouTube content you see from us from H2O or quote unquote H2O, you know, where H2O used to be, but from Ocean City doesn't involve any of that party stuff or burnouts. I mean, I love a burnout like everyone else, right? but there's a time and place for it. And obviously some would argue that Ocean City is that time and place to do it. But uh, I mean, my opinion of that side of H2O is there's a lot of growing up to be done a lot of a lot of there's a lot of kids that show up there that are doing it for the gram or doing it for likes and follows and stuff or doing it because they're drunk and they want to impress their friends or they just have that attitude they just they're just wild yeah, wild I mean, men reckless, in the making reckless yeah. mentality kind and, of, and that's but... okay that's life you, you get that i don't condone it and but i've got plenty of friends that are like that and they're still my friends mm-hmm. but once you get into that mob mentality like mindset i guess or or that whole issue of mob mentality then nobody's rational thinking right rational thinking's gone out the door and it's like it it, that's when things get crazy so i wish there was less of that and more camaraderie like good camaraderie at those shows where it's like everybody like was just as excited to pick up after themselves as they are to see a burnout as they they are to see some like like subaru do a burnout. I, I, I don't know. I, I like all of it. You guys are all my friends. I just, <laughs> I just wish we could all like sort it out. So towns didn't hate us. And his second part, Luke asks is Cor- uh, also, when is Corey bringing in a Trabant? Uh, crickets. Soon. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yep. I have friends sending me ads all the time. E- so Amy and Steve, right? Yep. So soon. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I mean, I already got one of the Eastern European cars done. I had that. Exactly. You know, I got the Jiguli brought over. So now you need to do a Trabant. You need to bring a Trabant over because they look similar to a 700. Exactly. They've got yeah. the rear fins on the rear fenders and stuff. Like, yeah, we need a slammed Trabant needs to be cruising around with that 700. Yep. Like, I'm working on it. <laughs> now that I'm talking, dude, get the 190 done. Yes, sell it. Dude, yes. you could buy a Trabant for $5. I know. <laughs> I know, I know this. They throw them away. 
<laughs> it's so funny to listen to people that are from like Eastern Europe. It's so funny to see the look on their face when we tell them how how excited we are about Lattas and Trabants, and they're like, no, no, Ugh. like Victor, my buddy Victor from Moscow, like literally, like went up one side of me and down the other when I told him I imported a Lada to America. And he's like, why? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I was throw like, it away. I was like, because I like it. And he's like, why? And he's like, these cars are complete. He's like, it's not even a car. Anyway, yeah. So a Trabant soon. That'd be awesome because yeah. my 700 needs a, a little Eastern European companion to cruise around with. So our buddy Austin Harley asks the next series of questions. Uh, he's a New Hampshire native as well. He says, uh, if you were to sell the Century, what car or cars would you be seeking since it's a dream car of yours? Excuse me. Um, that's a really good question. And as you brought up, yes. Corey, um, we had this conversation about the seven series on episode 24 of the revival motoring podcast, yep. where they asked me if you were to sell the seven series, what car would you replace it with? Excuse me. This root beer is, uh, bringing up the burps here. Um, boy, I don't know. What would I buy if I sold the century? There are a couple cars on deck, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Boy, I'm kind of on the spot on that one. I should have thought that one through before we started this. Um, I was going to purchase a Haku Skyline before I bought the Century. Mm -hmm. When I sold the 7 Series, I had the money for it. And I had the Let me be clear. I had the money for a sedan. I had the money for a saloon Haku. And it was one in England that was for sale that was a runner, bone stock. That's what I would want. I wouldn't want like one that had been like half project or whatever. To me, it sounds so cliche for me, at least for someone who likes weird stuff to say a skyline. But I just love, I'd love a Haku. Absolutely. I'd love one of those. Um, or even an R30 or an R31. Yep. I like those cars a lot. But um, yeah, probably one of those. There's, there's a handful of other cars I'd probably buy too. But that's the first thing that came to mind. He also asks for you both, if you could move anywhere outside the U.S., where would you live and why? I, I asked you this before we went live so we could kind of think about it because we'd sit here dead silence forever trying to figure it out. There's so many variables involved in that. But if we were to just throw one off the top of your head, you know, I, I've been lucky enough to travel all over Europe and, and a few other places outside of that. But I went on a trip through Italy. I drove through Italy last year after New Year's and driving down the coast of Italy is unbelievable. So I'd love to have, I'd love to have like a winter home in middle to Southern Italy somewhere and have like an old, uh, I don't know, like an old Italian sports car. Yeah. You know, like an old Italian sports car to cruise around the mountains with or something like that. So yeah, probably, I don't know, Italy. I'm just throwing that out though, but Switzerland's, Switzerland's beautiful. Germany's beautiful. I don't know. Japan looks like it's awesome. I haven't been there yet, but Italy for places I've been to, it'd be Italy. Yeah. Probably. The food's amazing. It's cheap. Like for the most part, like food's cheap. And, uh, yeah. 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 It'd be, it'd be hard to nail one down and say one place specifically, especially where all the places we've been. Like I feel for me, a lot of places that we've been, I never would have thought that I could live there, but after being there and like seeing the cities i could definitely live there like one yeah. right off the top of my head cologne germany like yeah i never would think prior to going there like oh i'd move to cologne germany but now going there definitely yeah you know that was a cool cool city um because we, we spent time walking around that city too we, did, we walked yeah. over the padlock bridge yeah you know, the bridge has all the padlocks on it and yeah. we we stopped at like some little pizza shop and yeah we did a ton of walking around there with marcel that was a yeah that was that was a really cool city we get to see it at night in nice weather. Mm -hmm. um, moving forward, uh, Austin always also says, uh, what do you love most about the automotive lifestyle and what do you dislike? Uh, what I love most about the automotive lifestyle is traveling and meeting new people, meeting yeah. new future friends. Uh, just the trips we just talked about. I, I wouldn't have driven across Europe or anything like that if it wasn't for the automotive industry or the automotive community lifestyle, whatever you want to call it. So that's what I love most about it is it puts you in touch with these people that become your friends or mentors, people you can learn things from and you, you know, you can grow in that, in that community. And it's, uh, you can learn a trade, you can learn a trade skill in that community too, which is amazing. You know, you can learn more about 
working on cars and right and then yeah you can work with other people that have different skills and yeah yeah that's yeah. what i like the most about it what i dislike most is i guess what anyone would dislike about any other community of people is just immaturity and self-centeredness and you know just not having respect for other people i right. guess because you see that a lot at car shows and going back to ocean city you see that in ocean city and you see that in other towns too where you get a group of kids that just are trying to show off and they just leave a trail of destruction behind them. And that, that's what I dislike most, I think. So moving forward with the questions, my friend, Logan Labrani, Logan Labrani. He actually lives. I could throw a rock from my house and probably hit his house. It was right down the street here. Uh, he asked, have you ever had the opportunity to purchase one of your quote unquote dream cars in past? No, because, well, I use the word dream car pretty loosely, because they're cars that I've always wanted to acquire, but they're not like astronomically expensive cars. I did pass on a few E9 BMWs. And this was in the last 10 years, long before they skyrocketed in price. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, yeah, so I passed on a few of those because of like what now, now are just small little things for how valuable those E9s are now. It's like, you should have just bought it. But at the time it was like, either had a little bit too much rust or needed a little bit more work than I wanted. And so I passed on them for like $2,000 too. Of course. Like just stupid, you know, we all make mistakes. Um, moving forward, our buddy BJ McArdle asks, well, first of all, he says, not a question, but I hope you're all having a wonderful day and weekend. BJ, I hope you had a great weekend as well. And I hope you're having a good Monday today as well. BJ's awesome, He's such a nice dude. But then he asks, what's your favorite thing on the Dunkin' Donuts menu? <laughs> All. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I only go there for coffee. I even don't eat the donuts there much anymore. I've been real good about my sugar intake. So <laughs> I like the coffee. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. And I'll go there every fall, man. I'm excited to see the pumpkin come back. Yeah, me too. I don't I'm care. always sad when it goes. <laughs> I don't care how white girl that makes me seem. I've been made fun of in the car. I've I, I've on the spot, but man, I'm telling you, just that pumpkin pumpkin swirl and that coffee is just so good. And I hate anything pumpkin usually. You couldn't catch me eating pumpkin pie if it saved my life. But yeah, and I think it was, it might have been you. Might have been some. I feel like somebody was drinking pumpkin swirl coffee or something, and I made fun of them. And they're like, "Dude, try it." And I sipped it, and I was like. Yeah, well, that's my new favorite thing. <laughs> I never so quickly put my foot in my own mouth. Yeah. Oh, it was so funny. Um, but BJ also asks, what car that's considered an old man car do you secretly or not so secretly love? This one's easy, my friend. <laughs> Corey knows exactly where I'm going with this. I have always wanted a, a Mopar K car. Yep. And I am not ashamed to admit it. I want, I want a... Plymouth Horizon. I want a first gen caravan, all with the 2.2 turbo with a manual gearbox, by the way. But I really want a K car wagon. I love a K car wagon. I just like the the Reliance, the Omnis, the Horizons, the Caravans. Uh, pre shadow, though. Pre shadow. Mm -hmm. I want a Reliant. I want a Reliant wagon so bad. And you don't get any more old man car than that. I mean, maybe a Caprice wagon is more old, you know, like a Mercury. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like Grand Marquis wagon, like Beaverwood, like National Lampoon's car. Exactly. I don't want one, but that's like an old man style car, like a Buick LeSabre or something. But a K car is definitely old man car. And I not so secretly want one. I'm going to do one one day and it's going to be a cool one. It's going to be a 2.2 turbo mm -hmm. with the manual. It's going to be an OEM drivetrain. It'll be a cool little car. <laughs> uh, Roback 002 asks, do you have a hard time building your quote unquote dream cars and then selling them soon after? Not really. Um, no, because I never have that intention when I get into it. So I get into it thinking, um, you know, may not own this forever, but I'm going to get into it and I'm going to enjoy it. But then the opportunity to make money on selling the car and then move that money into another car that that I would I would consider one of my bucket list cars or a car that I'm just excited to get into always presents itself and that makes it worth it. Cause I, I don't have like I don't have the money to just be buying cars left, right, and center. Otherwise I'd have a warehouse bunker somewhere just filled with cars. Now that's the dream, obviously, but yeah, no, I don't have a I don't I don't have a hard time doing that at all. Some cars I, I'm more uh hesitant to, but I don't have a problem with it. 
moving forward into questions. We're almost done. We're going to do a few more of these. We're we're uh, we're we're going to close this up here pretty soon. Um, let me see. This is actually kind of a cool question. Uh, Filthy East Coast Scum <laughs> asks, um, we know you like both, but who do you think did it better in the late 50s, the United States or Euro slash Germany? So if you said late 60s, I'd say America, just because I grew up in a household that had late 60s GM muscle cars. But late 50s, we're getting real close to a pretty close tie. Because for me, I'm not really into the fin, the fin years, like the the vast Cadillac fins yeah. of the 50s here in America. I'm not into that. I like the big boat cars of America, but I'm not really into the big crazy fins. It wasn't until the mid 60s where I really got into the Cadillacs and Lincolns, where the the fin craze, like that over extension, like that over done, like I don't know, gaudiness, the chrome and all the giant fins. Mm-hmm. But in Germany in the late 50s, we saw the 507 BMW. Yep. And we saw the birth of like the first S-Class, which I luckily enough was able to own. The 1960 S-Class was like the first one. Um, I'd say Euro Germany in the late 50s. That's my take, late yeah. 50s. One could argue late 50s America, we were on the cusp of, you know, the 60s, which was, you know, we saw we saw the birth of, uh, oh, the lights get dim. We saw the birth of like muscle cars in in uh in the 60s in america so yeah i'd say 50s for the 50s it's, it's definitely europe and germany for those of you watching on youtube oh, my light just got like super dim for some reason so we might have the rest of this we're going to close this up soon so if the if the lighting gets pretty bad for the video i apologize got a few more questions the dad bod says uh, what vehicles do you have your sights on next we know you like oh we just lost the power just went out. We're working off battery. We're still going to go. Oh, yeah. Power's back. <laughs> so as I mentioned before, we had power out. We had power outages all all night, last night, and most of the morning today. So it doesn't surprise me. It's still a windy day outside, and there's still a lot of... Uh, They're probably working on power. Yeah, and there's still a lot of trees coming down because it's still windy out there. Yeah. Video is going to be pretty funny here at the end because the lights keep coming on and off. But for those of you on Spotify and iTunes, we're doing just fine. we got battery back up. So... To finish this up with the Q&A, the dad bod asks, uh, what vehicles do you have your sights on next? Uh, we know you like to be three steps ahead. Mm-hmm. I'm glad it looks like I'm three steps ahead because I don't, <laughs> I don't think I am by any means. Um, sights on next. I don't know. I really don't know. I'd love to have a Haku. I'd love to, I'd love to do that. Um, you can hear my printer running in the, in the next room <laughs> yeah. over. This isn't a uh, uh, this isn't a in a sound tight podcast studio. Yeah, I don't know. I really that's that's a that's a tough one. I'd like to do something like as an off road rig someday soon. I'd like to do a classic one uh, Land Rover, possibly like a three door Land Rover. Yep. Moving on though, uh, let me see. Hmm, I'm gonna pick the last like two good ones. Matt Colfer asks, you're usually modifying older vehicles. Any 21st century cars on your list to modify? Yeah, man. It's not It's not actually on the list because I'm not actually going to buy one just because I don't have – there's no place in my life right now space-wise, uh, utilitarian-wise, and financially for a new car. But a Volvo S90 is one. Like that's yep. – I love the Volvo S90. That's such a beautiful-looking car. Uh, there's a Volvo dealership right here in my town and they have a black or they had a black one with the peanut butter interior and I was able to sit in that car and that thing was just a beautiful, beautiful car. So yeah, a Volvo S90 would be pretty sweet. Um, our buddy Kevin from Keen, mm-hmm. uh, our friend Kevin from Keen Suspensions in Belgium who does all the social media for Andy and Kenny at Keen has a bagged S90 and I think his Instagram is Kev, K-E-V underscore Keen, K-E-A-N. And go check him out. He's got a bagged S90, and the thing looks amazing. That'd probably be my first off the top of my head pick for a 21st century car. And I think we'll, uh, I think we'll close it up with uh, Zach Wilson from Bag Riders question. He said, "What can our car community do to make a positive impact on society?" And I mean, first thing that comes to mind is just act like decent human beings. You know, be respectful of others, uh, help each other out, just be kind. Yeah. I don't know, like normal stuff. Yeah. Like just obvious 
stuff <laughs> i guess I, I mean yeah you would think it would be obvious but but yeah yeah it's, it's focus not. focus more on each other rather than rather than i don't know what i'm getting at well yeah, yeah other than yourself you know, but other than yeah, like like just focusing on like looking out for number one i guess in the sense of like trying to just promote yourself and not like lifting others up you know um because lifting your friends up is incredibly rewarding Mm -hmm. Like I just, that's half the reason why I started this podcast. The first two episodes is obviously just us here hanging out, but I started this podcast so I could have my friends on, obviously you're on, but like other friends from all, all different walks of life and, and listen to them talk, give right. them a platform, you know, if this becomes a platform of sorts, you know, and listen right. to them speak. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I think we can do. I think if more people just were kind and respectful to others outside that community, I think the community would, would serve as a light. I think a lot more people who aren't in the automotive community would say, Hey, you know, like we used to have all these guys come into our town and do burnouts and, and we're just disrespectful all around. But then, you know, it seems like that's lightened up. It seems like more people are picking up after themselves and being, being kind. And yeah. So I don't know. I think that's my overall take. I think, and I think that's a good point to land on, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Be kind to others, everyone. I'm trying every day too. It's hard. It, life is hard. Life is not easy. It's it's hard to stay above the water. Work sucks. You know, it's just, you're hearing this on a Monday. I mean, a lot of you are probably not in a place you want to be right now, physically, maybe even mentally too, but you probably don't want to be at work. I, you know, Lord knows I don't like working either, but yeah, there's, yeah, there's sunshine up ahead. That's for sure. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Be kind to your friends. Be kind to strangers. Help old ladies across the street. You know, I don't know. Like just, yeah, just be, it's rewarding. and it, It'll make you feel good. And uh, I think that's what we'll end on. We're a good hour and a half into this, I think. Yeah, we, we're an hour and 36 minutes in. We've, we've, we've talked your guys' ear off enough on this Monday morning. So thank you guys so much for listening to episode two. Uh, I am John Ludwig. This is Corey Marshall. I don't know if you guys can even see us on YouTube now that the lights are off. We're, we're in the dark. Luckily, everything's on battery power, but we are currently out of power. So we're going to go down into the shop and see what we can or can't do on the Toyota Century. So, yeah, we uh, we will see you guys and hear – you guys will hear us, I mean. Uh, next Saturday, we'll be sitting down with Josh Garcia from Revival Motoring Podcast and uh, Gangstout from way back in the day. Mm -hmm. So we're going to drive down to Providence, Rhode Island next Saturday. Uh, you'll probably go with me, right? Yeah, I'll go. Yeah. Get some food, get some halal. And yeah. Yeah, that was amazing last time. So if you guys are in the Providence area next Saturday, uh, definitely hit me up. We'll be down there. I'll be putting out a uh, an Instagram story looking for some questions that you guys want to hear answers from from Josh uh, probably next Friday. So look for that Friday. We'll be in Providence Saturday. And uh, we'll see you guys in episode three. See you guys. See ya. See <laughs> ya.